Thank you, Anna, for reading for us. And thank you all for joining us tonight on a warm, sticky evening. We're going to be looking at um, two psalms over the next two weeks. Psalm 49 tonight and Psalm 73 next week. And the title for the series is Money Can't Buy You Life. And that's the title because both psalms talk about rich people. More specifically, they're both written by a believer in God who is looking across at rich people around them who care nothing for God. People utterly ignoring their creator, but with piles of cash. These psalms process a a believer's reaction to the unbelieving rich. So, as we kick off, let me ask you, how do you feel about the rich and famous? What do you make of the headlines about how many millions the Apple executives or premiership footballers are making this year? And I'm asking, how do you honestly feel? Honestly. Because that's one of the great things about the Psalms, actually. They're they're kind of God-endorsed prayers and poems and songs, and they're refreshingly honest. Over these two weeks, we're not going to get a kind of polite English response to the rich, a kind of... Oh, how nice. That's just lovely for them. I'm thrilled. No, we get honesty. So next week, envy. That's an honest response, isn't it? To the rich, envy. I look across at the rich people and I want what they've got. That's Psalm 73. How come they ignore God and have such an easy life while I'm trying to follow Jesus and struggling? That's next week, envy. But this week's reaction to the rich is fear. Just look at that in verse 5. And please keep your Bibles open at page 567. And that will really help me and hopefully help you. Verse 5 is the key question. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? Why should I fear? And then verse 16, the conclusion, be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. The issue today is fear. The psalm opens asking, why should I be afraid? And concludes saying, don't be afraid of the rich and the famous. Which on the surface sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? I wonder how many of us, when I asked you earlier, what what do you feel about the rich? I wonder how many of us actually said, Do you know, I'm a bit scared of them, honestly. It's a surprising question. Why should I fear the rich? But actually, as I've pondered this, I think it's hugely relevant. I think we're far more intimidated by by the rich and the impressive around us than we like to think. So, if you're a Christian here, who are the people you find it hardest to talk to about Jesus? If you're anything like me, it's those who seem to have everything together. The success stories in life, the rich. I still remember the the mince pie party that Jess and I threw for our neighbours at our last flat. We were hoping they'd they'd come along to a a carol service at St Helens, Um, so so we popped in some invites for mulled wine beforehand. And wonderfully, a a few neighbours did come round. Um, They said they didn't want to head on to church afterwards, but but that's okay. Sometimes a a conversation is much better, actually, than, than an event. Um, And and I thought, here we go, we're going to get to know them, and surely as they ask about us, there'll be a chance to speak of Jesus. Except, I'm ashamed to say, we were intimidated. You see, it turned out that our neighbours were a whole lot older, and posher, and richer than us. We lived in in a tiny basement flat. They lived in big Victorian mansions. We loved, well, I loved to talk about how we got our IKEA furniture free on FreeCycle. Their conversation was about how many millions the last complete house on the road sold for. And Jess and I sat there feeling small and embarrassed for our cheap wine, our, our mismatched crockery, and our presumption for thinking that we had something to offer them. See, fearing the rich can silence witness. 
That was at home. But I'm sure the same thing happens at work. So, so where do we find it hardest to take a kind of moral stand as Christians? Isn't it when the boss is in the room? Or when the student president or the sports captain is there that we're tempted to take one drink too many? I guess for any new graduates here about to start your, your first job in the big smoke, well, this is going to be a huge challenge, the intimidation of the firm or the boss. A senior friend actually once told me that his bank ran on fear. And it's not just banks. I remember walking into a a big city law firm and my first time in I was helping run a Christianity Explored course and as I sat in this huge atrium on a a kind of plush leather sofa with the trappings of success all around and sitting opposite a painting that was probably worth more than me, my kind of entire net worth, (laughs) well... I felt deeply intimidated, to be honest. What do I possibly have to say to these people? And I think it's the same in wider British society as well. Why do we find it hard to speak up for Bible truth in the public sphere? Well, because the elite don't want it. The rich, the powerful, the media, the politicians. You see, being intimidated by the rich and famous is a, is a real problem at home, at work, at large. I think we're easily overawed by the seemingly successful. And it does silence us. So then, we need Psalm 49. We need the the wisdom that verse 3 promises to us. That's the claim of of the opening of Psalm 49, that there's, there's a nugget of truth in here, an insight that's so profound, it can free us from fearing the rich and famous. But actually, interestingly, the psalm isn't addressed just to the small and the scared. Look at verse 1. Hear this, all peoples. So not just the poor, the powerless, but give ear all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. So actually, even if any celebrities or cabinet ministers or millionaires have snuck in, even if you are someone here tonight, well, this psalm is for you. There's wisdom here that every single human being needs to hear. And so I'm praying that God will give us not just ears to hear it for ourselves, but courage. Courage to share it with London. So, let's look at the wisdom on offer. The key question, you'll see there's a handout on the back of the service sheet if you haven't found it already. The the key question is, why should I fear the rich? And there are two parts to the answer. Firstly, why should I fear the rich when money can't ransom from death, point A, and then point B, when God will ransom and receive me. So money can't ransom from death, but God will ransom and receive me, so therefore why should I fear the rich? Firstly then, verses 6 to 13, money can't ransom from death. Let's get a run up from verse 5. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches, truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. There's the basic answer. Why should I fear the rich when money can't ransom from death? So, the rich have lots of money. Lots of money gives you lots of power. In life, you can buy your way into or out of almost anything, but not death. Truly, no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. Death is the one area where having rich friends or a family inheritance or a heaving bank account will not help you. Sterling is worth nothing at the grave. Why? Well, verse 8, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. It's too expensive. You you could never afford it. Quick definition here. So ransom. Do you know what ransom is? Think kind of um, hostage payment. So um, Somali pirates demanding three million quid for a captured tourist. Except the problem with death is that it can't be bought off with three million quid. If it could, then the rich would be fine. I mean, just hand in the cheque. 
three million quid doesn't cut it with death. So, so then what is the price? If, if three million is, is not high enough, what, what's the kind of going rate for a human life according to the Bible? Well, to answer that, we need to go all the way back to the start. Genesis 3 is where we're explained. Don't worry to turn there, but that's where um, we see the reason for why humanity became hostage to death in the first place. And the answer is simple, but scary. The answer to why we're hostages is that we deserve to be. You see, even though God is our maker, our sustainer, the giver of all good things, well, we've decided to run life our way. We've rejected him. And what do you think happens if you reject the giver of life? Well, he told us, actually. He warned us. You will surely die. So then we're not kind of innocent victims unfairly ambushed by that greedy pirate death. No, we deserve to die. We're on death row because we deserve to be rejecting the maker of life. So then back to the the question, what price a life? How big a bribe would it take to open the doors of death row? Well, here's the problem. God cannot be bought Verse 8, the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. God doesn't accept Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Electron. Cash, not accepted. The only way out would be to live the perfect life, to, to love God and to love others. But none of us have done that. None of us could do that. Which incidentally shows the absurdity of... of um, thinking that just by giving some money or time to to church or to charity, just by occasionally making a sacrifice to save the planet, that that will somehow win God over. It's a common view, isn't it? Uh, Give God a little bit to keep him happy. But it's utterly absurd. Do you know, two psalms on from this, David himself says, who made a lot of sacrifices, you will not delight in sacrifice. You will not be pleased by a burnt offering. It doesn't matter how many bulls you buy and you burn. It doesn't matter how many nurseries or or churches you build, how many thousands you give. No man can give to God the price of his life. So then, can we start to see why it's foolish to be intimidated by the rich? So yeah, in this life, they have a lot of influence, a lot of power. At the moment, they can have their way in almost every area. But when it comes to death, they've got nothing. We've all got nothing. We're all in the dock with nothing. That's the first big point. Why should I fear the rich when money can't ransom from death? At which point, I think we might, we might be thinking... Okay, I can see in the specific area of life after death that money isn't much use. But to be honest, I don't think about the afterlife much anyway. It's ages away, and it's not that big a deal. For for the moment, I'd rather focus on making some money, which is definitely useful here and now, and I'm just going to take my chances on what happens in the future. Isn't that the plan of many young Londoners? Uh, get rich in my 20s, retire in my 30s, enjoy my 40s, and maybe in my 50s, I'll give God some thoughts. After all, I know that money is useful, but I don't know what the future holds. Well, I think that's where verses 10 to 13 come in. Verse 13 talks of those who have foolish confidence. And I think the the confidence being talked about is the idea that that becoming wealthy or becoming famous or or being a success in this life is a higher priority than sorting out your own death. Let's just think for a moment how foolish that really is. Do you know what the statistics are of um, how many people out of 100 currently die? It's 100. 100. 10 out of every 10. A billion out of every billion humans dies. There's plenty of evidence. They say, actually, that the two certainties of life are death and taxes. But it turns out, if you, if you have enough money, you can pay someone who's clever enough to set up a holding company, which then means you barely need to pay tax. But you can't hire a financial advisor to get you out of death. 
It is the certainty of life, the one thing that cannot be avoided. And so just, just think of the folly of spending your life chasing things that may never happen, chasing the money to give you the power to do the things you may never have time for, chasing the status that, that's offered slightly higher up the ladder, all the time forgetting that death is going to kick me off the ladder. Just look at how verses 10 to 11 drive home the the universal certainty of death. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Man in his pomp will not remain, he's like the beasts that perish. Doesn't matter how clever how rich, how famous, every single human being will perish. Get a first at uni, make a million, buy a holiday home, be an Olympian. Whatever I'm worth now, in 80 years, I'll have none of it. Verse 10, they must perish and leave their wealth to others. 10 out of 10 humans die. There's no discrimination, no favoritism, no respect of class or wealth or intellect or fame. Man in his pomp will not remain. Look, I know it's not much fun spending the evening thinking about death. But I hope we come to church not not just for entertainment's sake. And true wisdom faces reality. Our culture has buried death under euphemisms and jokes. We, We try our best not to talk about it, but Psalm 49 says that's foolish. Can't you see it's coming? Wise up. I mean, if you want evidence, just look around the room. One of the benefits of of kind of meeting in St. Helens is that every week we are sitting in a graveyard. Have you noticed that? It's on the walls, underneath you. It's all a memorial to man in his pomp will not remain. So, take... Sir Thomas Gresham, who's that big box, or was in that big box in the corner. Sir Thomas Gresham, knight. Now, he was a big hitter. I reckon if you ended up sitting next to him in in his day at a city dinner, you would have been properly intimidated. So he was one of the richest men in England. He was a brilliant merchant. He founded the Royal Exchange. He was key advisor to three successive monarchs. In fact, he lived, the, he, he lived the end of verse 11 dream. He had land called after his name, Gresham Street, a few minutes' walk down there. And he was an arms dealer. So, you're sitting next to Thomas Gresham, sir, sorry, sir Thomas Gresham Knight. Pretty scary. But the folks sitting over there now, next to him, it's a different experience, isn't it? See, even Thomas Gresham, sir, couldn't trade his way out of death. I don't actually know whether he trusted Jesus or not when his time came, but that is the only relevant question. See, money can, it can build you a big box to die in, but it cannot ransom you from death. All of which means Psalm 49 is not saying, look, money does the important stuff, but I've managed to think of one tiny area where actually money isn't that useful. No, this is the area, says Psalm 49. This is the surely the most important question of life. How am I going to cope with death? Can I be prepared? It's the one thing that certainly lies ahead. So a modern case study, was the life of Steve Jobs a success? In many ways, he was a great man. I'm thankful for his um, inventions. Uh, He's a visionary leader, a brilliant mind. He reshaped the phone industry. He he redefined the music industry. He remade Apple into the richest company on the planet. But all of Apple's coffers cannot ransom from death. Psalm 49 says, the only question is, are you ready to meet Jesus? Jesus. And if we're still thinking that money or or fame or whatever else is what makes a successful life, well, verse 13 says, 
This is the path of those who have foolish confidence, and yet after them people approve of their boasts. That's point A. Money can't ransom from death. But secondly, and more briefly, from verses 14 and 15, God will ransom and receive me. Point B, God will ransom and receive me. I think actually these are the most shocking verses in the psalm. Shocking both because of the the terrifying imagery they give of death, but also for the remarkable hope put alongside it. Just look at the horror of, of how humanity is described, verse 14. Like sheep, they're appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol, with no place to dwell. It's a sobering set of images. Verse 14 says, there's an unmissable appointment with death, to which death will shepherd them. That is, they're already in the queue for the crematorium. They're like sheep with a time slot at the abattoir. And actually it gets worse. So the end of verse 14, in Sheol they'll find themselves homeless with no place to dwell and kind of devoured. Their form shall be consumed. It is a horrific picture It's an early taste of what Jesus would teach on and describe as hell. But strikingly, just as as the fate of humanity is is described in its bleakest terms, well, alongside that, a, a shred of hope is given. So middle of verse 14, the upright shall rule over them in the morning. You see, there's a there's a different group there. People not being ruled by death, but instead reigning. In the morning, presumably some kind of beyond death. And what makes the difference? Well, verse 15 does. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. God will ransom my soul. God will receive me. See, every human being is going to be received, either by the hideous, homeless, homeless, consuming darkness of hell, or by the loving welcome of God. And what makes the difference? Well, again, it's ransom. It's the hostage payment. It's the price on our life. And this time, whereas back in verse 8, no amount of money or influence could buy our release, well, this time, verse 13, God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol. And actually, at this point in the Bible, I think in some ways that's even more surprising and shocking than the horrible imagery. It's clearly talking about life after death, life beyond the grave. And at this point, as God's unfolding his plan, he hasn't said much about this. But a clear promise that while money can't save us from death, God will meet us beyond the grave for those who trust in Jesus. Now, here we're not told what the ransom he'll achieve is. We have to read on a lot of years later for that. But we've been hearing it all night, haven't we, from 1 Peter? Um, It was on the, the front of the service sheet. Let me read it. You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Money can't pay the price, but a perfect life of obedience can And Jesus, the God-man, lived the life I should have, died the death I deserved, and so paid my ransom. And that is the heart of the Christian message. I don't know if you've wandered in over the summer, whether whether Christian things are are quite new to you, but this is the absolute core, that, that what I could never do for myself, Jesus Christ has done for me. He's paid the ransom. He's cleared my debts. And that's part B of the answer. God will ransom and receive me. And if you're not a believer here, this is one of the biggest reasons to become a Christian and to become one quickly, as soon as you can. Jesus can offer what no one else, what nothing else in the world can. 
do chat to me or, or chat to a friend if you want to understand how. But for those of us who are believers, how do you think it applies? How should we apply that truth? Well, verse 16 tells us. Often the Bible applies itself, and here verse 16 tells us how to react. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. Don't fear the rich. And do you understand why now? Because when you factor in death, well, money has no answer, but Christianity does. When you face death, it it doesn't matter how many houses or degrees or cars or awards or Twitter followers or millions you have. Death is no respecter of persons. And ultimately, that's the wisdom that the psalm promised us at the start. You see, the conclusion of of wisdom is don't be intimidated by appearance. Don't judge just by how things look now. So yeah, verse 13, uh, sorry, verse 18, though while he lives, he counts himself blessed. Though you get praise when you do well for yourself, Reality is in verse 17. When he dies, he'll carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. Or verse 19 says the same. See, true wisdom sees beyond appearance, doesn't judge by today alone. And it may be for some of us who've been away from kind of normal routine for a bit. Perhaps you you haven't met God's people for a while, you haven't read the Bible for a while. Well, this is a good reality check, isn't it? Reality is defined not just by what I see, but what God says, by real wisdom, not just current experience. That's why the final verse flags up the need for understanding. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. That's pretty blunt, isn't it? But it's true. Most of humanity is hurtling towards their death without even thinking about it chasing the money, the career, the house, the gadget, without even stopping to consider their mortality. Sheep, en route to the abattoir, none the wiser. So then, as we close, I don't know who it is you're currently intimidated by. That would be a great thing to chat um, over those cakes which may or may not appear. Who are we scared to be openly Christian around? Here's my practical suggestion next time you're feeling overawed. The self-help manuals tell you, um, if you're feeling scared, try to picture your audience in their underpants, which is not something I've tried, just to reassure you. (laughs) But Psalm 49 is far more radical than that. Psalm 49 says, don't picture them in their boxes, picture them on their deathbed. I know that's blunt, but that is reality. And true wisdom faces reality. To face God unforgiven, that is poverty. Man is in his pomp without understanding is like the beasts that perish. That is what will turn our hearts from fear to compassion for those around us in London. So then, who are you scared to be openly Christian around? Colleagues? Family? Neighbours like mine with the mince pies. For me, actually, this week, it was meeting a semi-famous person. Um, A mutual friend linked me up with someone who who wanted to talk about grace for a project they were researching. And I thought, brilliant, brilliant. And then I googled their name, and hit after hit came up. Awards came up that they'd won. And you know how I felt, honestly? Scared. I was like, this is a big wig. I can't just tell them what the Bible says bluntly. Wonderfully, the Lord kindly had had me preaching on Psalm 49 the same week. And so I went in saying verse 17 to myself over and over, when this person dies, he'll carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. And we had a great chat. It was much better than the mince pies. So then, who are we scared of being openly Christian around? I'm praying that the Lord would give us courage to speak to the kind of audience verse 1 imagines, all inhabitants of the world, of London, both low and high, rich and poor. Because these two truths are things everyone needs to hear. 
Money cannot ransom you from death, but God has offered ransom through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you that it speaks truth. It doesn't flatter us, that it faces reality. But we thank you most of all, it's not just um, kind of hard truths, but wonderfully you've offered us a solution as well. You've offered us ransom for free through Jesus. And we thank you so much for that. Pray for anyone here who's wondering if that's really so precious if the blood of Jesus is really worth it. Please, Lord, would you persuade them of that? And please, for many of us, would you help us not to be intimidated by the seeming success around us? In Jesus' name, amen.